So hi, everyone. Um, I want to thank you for joining us tonight virtually. Um, I miss all of you, um, but we haven't um, yet welcomed back to our in-person MOA lectures yet. So in the meantime, we are doing um, virtual lectures. Um, my name is Allison. I'm the director here at the Museum of American Heritage. I know that um, some of you um, that have registered are not familiar with MOA. Um, so we are a small history museum um, located in Palo Alto, and I thank you um, for joining us tonight. Um, in the panel, we have um, Michelle Fabian, our operations manager, and she's going to help us uh, moderate um, any questions um, because we're going to be doing a Q&A session. Um, I also have Adam Williams and Simone Williams, who are giving the lecture tonight um, with us. Um, with that said, um, MOA has just wrapped the Baylug holiday show up a few weeks ago. And if you're members of MOA, you've probably seen the show. Um, and so, you know, this gives you a great context um, for this lecture um, because some of Adam and Simone's creations that they'll be talking about were displayed in the show. Um, I'm so glad to have Adam and Simone um, with us tonight doing a fun joint lecture. Um, Adam and Simone are a husband and wife team that build incredible Lego creations together. Um, during um, our past holiday show, uh, they created um, a volcano complete with um, moving lava and the waterfall. Um, and both Adam and Simone have also been members of the Bay Area Lego Users Group, AKA Bay Lug, um, one of our wonderful partners here at MOA. They uh, collaborate with us and um, the holiday show wouldn't have been possible without Bay Lug, Adam and Simone, as well as the members. Uh, they are both instrumental in the setup and management of the annual holiday show and they've been Bay Lug members for seven years. Uh, so with that said, um, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Adam and Simone. Yay, thank you. Yeah, so um, yeah, I'm Adam. I've got the green brick background. Um, and then my wife, Simone, is below with the red brick background. Um, and let's see, on the slide, we've got a cup, you know, little brick built versions of ourselves. Um, here. And I've got my email here. If there are any questions that we don't answer, or you want to talk, if you have any more questions for us, you can email me. My email is here. Or ask Allison, and we're happy to send you my contact info if you have any more questions. So um, with that, we'll get started. So why Lego? Why do we do this hobby? So um, we both got into this out of college. Um, we enjoyed this hobby because it was something that we both grew up with. And then we realized we could build together um, and create things together, which was really fun. We both like to make things and this was something we could do together. Um, we think this is a more sustainable way to make things because we can make something and then in a couple of years, we can take it apart and reuse those pieces to make something new and bigger and better. Um, and so we can continue to make things without filling up our limited living space or having to like throw away things or sell them or um, so like that. And then also we both have kind of different um, things that interest us with buildings. Like I like creating a lot of kinetic moving things and my wife likes making very pretty things. And we're able to combine both of those interests into one kind of combined creation, um, which I think is one of our strong suits. Um, one of the things that we really enjoy doing with our creations. So. Awesome. So a couple different sections that we'll get to go through today. Uh, we'll talk about what it means to be an adult fan of Lego or an AFOL. Uh, we'll get to look at some of the techniques that uh, as people start you know, building outside of sets, they start taking into account. Um, then we'll get to look at something uh, that a lot of adult fans are very interested in, which is unique park usage or how people use uh, things like flippers, you know, that are meant to go on like the little minifigure men and turn those into great rooftops or other unique things. 
Uh, then we'll get to take a look at some of the logistics of how we plan and prep for some of the, the shows that we do, including MOA. Uh, and then we'll get to take a look at some of the builds that we've done together over time and what we've got planned for the next couple of years too. Cool. So with that, we've, oh, why don't you go for it? Sorry. Yeah, no, no worries, no worries. Um, so one of the great ways to kind of start taking a look at what it means to be an adult fan of LEGO and how you build outside of sets, uh, a lot of different techniques can be seen through the uh, looking at castles. Oftentimes they're great at showing the difference between like scale and size of how you can manipulate people's view of what you're building. They often often have a lot of unique details. Like we see this piece on the left that's just brimming with, with little pieces all throughout the walls. Uh, and then oftentimes, just like this middle one, they'll include grand landscapes as well along with them. A unique technique that a lot of people don't know about until they really get into to Lego uh, is the idea of stop bricks. Um, if you don't mind going next slide. Yep. I also want to say before we jump, uh, we'll point out which mm. things are ours. Uh, we should have put credit to the people whose photos we used as examples. So like these are example castle photos. These aren't ours, but we'll point out the one, the photos that are ours. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Sweet. Uh, so snot brick stands for studs not on top. Uh, and these are the bricks that allow people to build sideways or upside down. Uh, all different directions when they're building with Legos. It really takes you beyond just the traditional box that you can build with uh, Legos that just go up and down. So there are lots of different bricks that allow you to build sideways. Uh, here's just a small sampling on this page, but that's what literally gives you like those really unique, interesting walls that you'll see on castle builds. Uh, other things that you can look at that really make castles unique and, and interesting at the adult level, uh, you can often see like things that are gravity defying, like the, thing on the, uh, the image on the left here. Uh, people play with proportions, uh, oftentimes building things in minifigure scale, or they'll do uh, things that look like they're minifigure scale, but are actually even bigger, um, which is exciting. Uh, people can incorporate story, like you see in the right hand photo where you've got the vines that show the age of the building. Uh, so that you can, it's a really, really good, nice canvas to, to incorporate those kind of elements as well. Uh, and people play a lot with different round towers. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can do round towers. Uh, a common one that Adam and I have used quite a bit is this one up on the top left, uh, where you take little one by one round bricks and you can put them between your traditional bricks. Uh, and with just a little bit of stress on the Legos, you can create a round uh, a tower by stacking those. We'll see uh, that used in one of our own projects here in just a little bit. Um, but there are lots of different ways, as you can see here, to use more snot bricks, just like we were talking about, uh, or wedge bricks in that bottom middle one to really get that unique technique. Um, other things that LEGO people sometimes like to make are um, interesting animals and other creatures. And these are, can be definitely a challenge. How do you get all these organic curved details using, you know, mostly rectangular bricks? And um, there are many opportunities to use interesting parts um, in unique ways when you're creating these animals. So um, here's an example of two different kind of animal creations. You can see the first one, they're both tigers, right? But you can see the one on the right has all these, you know, additional details, all the landscaping around it. And it's got, you know, more realistic colors. And it's interesting to see how Lego has evolved over time, where it used to be there was a very, you know, small subset of pieces that were available in colors. And over time, Lego has developed more parts, more colors, um, more ability to create more realistic animals or other, you know, more realistic landscapes and animals and things like the one on the right. So here are some more fun animals, all sorts of dogs and things. Yeah. Things that do well at competitions that we take things to show the texture that you see on the middle image that's again, very unique and uh, uses snot bricks to get those studs again, facing towards the side. Uh, you see that technique popping up everywhere as soon as you start looking for it. Uh, and then again, we see that landscape being built in the rightmost image, which does very well there. Uh, and then, of course, just like with castles, scale matters. Uh, so building something that gets at being close to life scale, super, super uh, impressive and, and displays very well. I love looking at these like large, you know, life size, large animals like the elephant. Uh, if you start breaking down how those are built, uh, you can see people use a, oh, do you mind? Yeah, next slide. Awesome. 
uh, people build a kind of a lattice of different, uh, you know, or a, a grid of bricks inside of it um, to add that structural stability. We got our very first, or my very first uh, foray into sculptural building just at this very last show. Uh, we're able to a little black cat uh, and used a technique almost identical to what they were doing here for these larger scale builds. You do this to conserve bricks so that you don't have to use as many and to add that structural stability. Um, really well. Yeah, there are all sorts of different ways, different kind of creations that people do. Sometimes people build buildings, sometimes they build animals, other people are interested in building mosaics. So like these are examples of just like a 2D flat uh, creation done with a bunch of little square bricks or plates or tiles or uh, slope pieces to create an image. And you could look back and see that image and that's uh, super cool also. Um, there are also, um, Lego has a collection of motors and gears and wheels and um, ways to create moving creations. And they even have, they go all the way up, they have robotics sets where they have programmable controllers that can, you know, you can program the motors and sensors to all move and create, you know, robots and other, you know, moving things with sophistication. So uh, it's cool that Lego has all these things and they, they all can integrate with each other. Um, there's some, some members in our club are interested in great ball contraptions. Um, so these are mechanisms that move these little um, you know, soccer balls or basketballs, all these little Lego balls from one spot to the other. So there's all sorts of these. Let me zoom in. So like here's one. Come on. Come on. Show me a ball. <laughs> well, anyway, let me jump to another one. Yeah, so you get the idea. So there's all there's all sorts of moving things that you can create with Lego, which is super cool. So uh, moving on. Awesome. Unique part usage is another thing that people are really into. Yeah, a very well known uh, builder in the Lego community is Jeff Friesen, who's well known for these micro cities. I believe he, he created a book that incorporates all of them as well. Uh, why he's really well known is he'll take very, very interesting pieces and use them in, in ways you wouldn't expect. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we can uh, digest one of these cities and kind of pull out some of the unique places he's pulled things from. Uh, so you can see that the hat on the minifigure on the right hand side, he's using that as the rooftop of a building in micro scale. Uh, the pipes are all of these little macaroni pieces is what we typically call them. Uh, so he gets that to get like a subway system going um, to make the, the buildings that make the, that the hats are acting as the roof on. He can use the antenna pieces, which originally came in like space sets um, as a really nice way to just incorporate all of these pieces that you just wouldn't expect. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is something that we all in the Lego community are really into is when you take a piece that you think you know all the purposes for and you see it used in a unique way. That's that's a really fun aspect of people's creations. And I'm definitely showing my bias here, but uh, uh, returning to the medieval times, I think uh, medieval cottages do an excellent job of showing unique parts usage often in the rooftops. Uh, and we'll get to see some details of that in the next slide, uh, but also in, in the different, oh, do you mind going back there? Oh. Yep, but also in just the different shapes that you get with the roofs. Like if you look at that rooftop on the bottom left corner here, look at the curve of the roof. That is just not something that you would expect when looking at a Lego brick and imagining building those and putting them on top of each other. Uh, the green one in the middle, same thing. Really, really unique shapes with really careful attention to detail and snot bricks again, oftentimes. Um, okay, I promised a detailed book. Uh, two of my favorites that you can find uh, online are the use of the little minifigure hands as a thatched roof over on the left hand side. Uh, and then over on the right, uh, just as promised, you can take the little flippers from the little minifigures and you can create an excellent rooftop with those as well. So really fun, unique part usage, something that once you start seeing it and you start seeing, oh, isn't that a, you know, dot, 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 you'll start seeing it everywhere in adult and in, in outside of sets. Uh, there's also a lot of interesting part usage and space creations. Some people are really into lots of Star Wars inspired spaceships and other um, creations. 
you can see all sorts of um, little tiny details to add, you know, sci-fi texture to creations. They call this greebling in the Lego community. So there's lots of greebling here, lots of little, little bits that are added to create various textures. Cool. So now I get to move into how do you plan a large mock? Uh, that's something Adam and I have become, uh, we, we've had to get good at over the last few years uh, as our you know, size of mock has increased. Uh, a lot of it comes down to the planning. Uh, so taking a look at where are you going to be breaking this up? Where are you gonna put the breakpoints in so that you can you know, travel with it for, for first thing? Uh, and where, like, where are you not gonna notice the seams as you, as you go through? Uh, so these are a couple of our mocks here on this slide. Uh, so you can see uh, two years ago, three years ago, we did a lighthouse that appeared in the, the corner of a MOA show. Uh, that was broken up into, I think, 10 or 11 different pieces. Uh, most of the rock face was all together because it was pretty structurally sound together. But most of the river was broken up into smaller pieces, typically about two base plates wide. Um, so that's you know, about 20 inches or so. Uh, that takes a lot of planning, something that we didn't do before that mock, and we definitely learned that we needed to do it with that mock uh, and everything that we've built, especially the jungle going forward. And then that top picture there, you can see just us packing things away so that we can try and bring it in as few carloads as possible um, as, we, as we travel. Uh, one of, oh yeah, go for it. Sure, there's a lot of other collaboration that we do, not just, but with us, but with the club as a whole. So we're members of the Bay Area Lego Users Group, which is a club of Lego enthusiasts like us from across the Bay. And we put on shows as a club. And so there's a lot of collaboration that goes into how do we take everybody's ideas and it's like herding cats coming up with every, everybody kind of taking their creative energy towards one theme or one display. And so like, we'll end up as a club design, you know, drafting up standards for we're going to make a beach and this is like a, a, you know, one section of the beach and it's going to have this much distance of water and then this much of sand and it's going to elevate to this height and then, and then we'll add a boardwalk to it and um, everybody will build their own little modules and connect them up um, and see how they, they kind of, they line up, but they're created by different people, which is fun. Another way that we can help plan things in advance uh, is, to be honest, we've used a lot of Microsoft Paint. Uh, if we're looking at little tiny details, it's excellent for counting, you know, what are the studs that we want to want to have things on. Uh, so this is a, a train that Adam put together called the Pineapple Express, uh, and literally he was mapping out, this is how I'm going to do the, the words on it in, in Microsoft Paint. As you get to some of our larger builds, uh, definitely taking a look, especially at the skyscrapers we've done uh, at plans for that skyscraper, you can get an idea of how many stories am I building here, how, you know, uh, this image on the right was excellent for taking a look at how many stories do I need to go up before I need to change the dimension of the outside, uh, and how can I plan to make them a really solid base that will work for that, or a solid inner structure that's going to support that. And then there are also digital design tools that some members use and we've used on occasion. Here's an example of a digital design that I created for a little Pokemon that was hidden in the jungle. And the advantage of these digital design tools is you have the palette of every single brick that's been made by man in every color possible. And so you can try a bunch of different designs without having all the pieces in your inventory or having to find all the pieces in your inventory. And then once you create it digitally, the, the software tools can help you spit out a set of instructions and spit out a part list that can then be sent to a website where you can buy the parts from that website. So um, we did that for this example here um, where I, figured out exactly what pieces I needed and then just ordered those parts and then put it together after the fact. Um, and some people do this, it's especially useful for smaller creations. It's um, not generally done, at least we don't generally do it for the large creations because it would take a lot of time to build out and then 
a lot of time to design on the computer and then a lot of time to build. But for small things, it definitely makes sense. So there are digital, and these digital tools are free. So this is LDRAW um, is the, the piece of software that we use. There is also um, BrickLink Studio is another common piece of software. Um, so, yeah. And now we're gonna get into um, some of the creations we've done over time. Um, so this was a project we did in 2018, this uh, ski resort. Um, and we actually have a video of it. Um, but I'm just gonna play a little bit of it. Um, if you wanna watch the whole video, cause we don't have enough time to go through the whole video, but you can look for Beyond the Brick Motorized Ski Resort. Watch the whole thing on YouTube. Um, this is me at a Lego competition and we had this, this mountain and we had motorized skiers that went down the mountain and then we had a big ski resort and we had these little ice skaters that went around the rink. So, yeah. And I've got this another- This ski resort was a, a particular challenge because you had to learn how to take the, the track that you see kind of going beyond, like within that, that ski slope and how to turn that sideways, how to support it enough that it could be taunt, uh, but also give it enough kind of flexibility and, and unique shaping that it looked more natural. Yeah. Uh, and then how to hide it as much as you could without uh -huh. getting the, the little skier stuck on it. Yeah, that's definitely the challenge with the this this creation and our creations in general with these moving things is we really like to do these moving things along with the aesthetic creations to bring the minifigures to life and bring the display to life. But then you have to try to conceal all of the moving things, uh, which can be tricky. So in the next, let's see, next, next slide, I have another um, picture of this. And I also have over here a video showing the, um, the skeleton with just the moving aspect. And so this is generally how we've been building things is the moving part, we build a skeleton first and make sure that this is gonna work reliably. And then after that, we'll build a shell around it. We'll build the rest of the snowy mountain around it um, once we've got the moving thing built. So, um, so that was 2018, 2019. Uh, we decided to build a Nutcracker Theater, you know, at the beginning of 2019, where we were like, what are we going to build? And we remembered back in 2015, when we, early on, when we started this hobby, we built this little, this, you know, fairly small by comparison theater, built this little tan theater, and we had, um, you know, an audience and we had an orchestra playing on stage. And we said, wouldn't it be awesome if we redid that theater, made it bigger and better, and we made moving dancers and they danced to the Nutcracker. And so that's what we did. Um, and played the video. And so we used, kind of hard to see, but we have little dancers on the stage that spun around. We had a programmable um, robotics brick that that we programmed to play the music um and the dancers danced to the music and then at the end of the scene the curtain would close and then the whole stage behind the curtain would rotate to another scene and so we had four different scenes so now we had dance of the sugar plum fairy going and then the the, the dancer would dance to that show so it was a super cool design we were able to hide it all behind the, the stage. Um, and yeah, so we had, we had underneath the stage, we had a whole bunch of gears that spun all the dancers with one motor. And then we had another motor that raised and lowered the curtain. And then we had a motor that rotated the whole stage to create this, the, to be able to show one scene at a time and change the scenes. A fun thing here that was hard to see if you didn't know what was what was happening behind the scenes is that even though you could only see one scene from the front of the theater, all of the dancers, even the ones, the three scenes that were behind the scenes, uh, were, were dancing to the same song and making the same rotations. And that was a really unique, a, a good thought for how to get it so that we only had to use one motor, which worked a lot better in the, the space mm -hmm. that was allotted. Yeah. 
yeah, there was definitely a challenge in how to fit all the moving things in that stage without while keeping the stage at the right size to be appropriate. So, which is typically a challenge with these moving things. Awesome. So we're at about the halfway point right now. Very curious if, if folks have questions we can help answer or things you're curious about and some of the things that we've been able to share thus far. Maybe as they come through, if you want to put them in the chat, uh, we can check back in a few minutes and, and help answer. Yeah. Cool. Uh, in, also in the beginning of 2020, uh, we got, uh, if you don't mind going next slide, we heard that the uh, the Brooks by the Bay uh, convention was going to have a theme of Vision 2020, very fitting for, for 2020. Uh, in the ideation phase, uh, we thought through a couple different things that we could do, uh, trying to do a life-size version of, of Vision from the Avengers came to mind. We explored that for a little bit. Uh, we ended up deciding against doing that just because the, the color of the bricks uh, is a little unique. Uh, and so it could have been quite expensive to gather that many bricks in those colors, um, but maybe it's something we'll return to in the future. So we kept thinking, we kept thinking, we're like, okay, vision, we've got eyes, what's something with eyes? And one night, uh, Lord of the Rings happened to be on. We're like, oh my goodness, there's a tower, which I love building towers that has a, a giant moving eye on top, and Adam loves building moving things. So we're like, okay, we're going to do the tower by our dirt, uh, and that's going to be our, our thing for 2020. So we spent a lot of time finding images of all of the details that were on the tower so that we could start getting things just right. That actually proved quite difficult. Uh, there are very, very few still film, like still images inside of the, the film itself that you can grab the details from. Uh, but luckily as they were making the film, they made lots of like uh, promotional like versions of the tower that are filled with details like this image on the right. Um, so we were able to kind of go off of that and get some scale and proportion. Uh, like we literally took rulers to, to images and we're trying to figure out, okay, if we're making this part this high, well, then all these other parts need to be about this high. Oh, so, so uh, we do have, uh, sorry, if I could yeah, interrupt here. Uh, we have a question um, from uh, Trevor and he wants to know how much does one of uh, these creations typically uh, cost? Ooh, That's that is... <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> That's a very hard question to answer because each of these creations is different sizes. And um, and the other thing that's difficult about this is that over time, um, we've built a collection. So you build something and then eventually you tear it apart. And then you have all those parts. And so trying to remember how much all the how much value was in all those parts when you reuse them in the next creation is hard. So like we've spent you know, there's a lot of parts in this giant tower and a lot of money in that, but but a lot of that we had from previous creations. So trying to figure out how much that is, is a lot, uh, it's tricky. Um, to give a rough estimate, it's a little high, but Barader uh, was gonna be around nine feet tall and about five foot in diameter. That was gonna be a couple thousand in pieces. Uh, but again, a lot of those we had from collecting since childhood uh, and every single piece was going to be reused in future projects so if we ever needed any more black pieces we were you know we're yeah i would say lego is is it, it sounds expensive and it is expensive when you get into it but eventually if you take your stuff apart then you reuse the pieces over and over and then it becomes more of an affordable hobby i would say yeah that's definitely something a lot of uh folks do keep their pieces together and they don't break them apart. Um, for us, we, we've always biased towards breaking them apart, mm -hmm. which can be sad, but it's always surprising how little time it takes to take them apart compared to how long how it takes long to build them. them. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, we have another question um, from um, Michael. Um, he, has, he wanted to know uh, how much of your time is spent on this hobby and what's the most rewarding part of the hobby for each of you? Okay, time spent, I would say this year, we'll get to our jungle display, but we spent probably, I don't know, every other weekend or so working, you know, I don't know, a half day at least every other weekend. Um, 
more obviously on on a chunk of weekends. So um, we spent a fair amount. <laughs> it's it's you know I would say you know the big hobby that we really like to do together. Um, the most satisfying part for me, at least, is um, I think when we come up with the initial idea of like, oh, we're going to build this theater and we're going to make it move. And then we build that first kind of concept idea of it where we start building that draft and you realize it's going to come together. And that's what's exciting is seeing it come to life, at least for me. What do you think, Simone? Yeah, time-wise, I know several of our creations are in the, the couple of hundred hours combined, uh, up to several hundred for something like this. Um, but you don't notice the time going by as much because it's it's just like playing video games or, or you know other like board games together type of thing. It's it's together time as well. Um, definitely, uh, like one of the the most rewarding things. It's it's super corny to say, but my goodness, when when kids come into like the Moa show and they get super excited because they're seeing these these things that are just very very different from the sets that they're used to with Lego, or they get to see all the little moving pieces that Adam's put together. That's that's really, really, really fun, especially when they ask questions about them. Cool. Shall we continue on for just a little bit? Yeah, yep. sure. Next slide. Sweet. So continuing, uh, we did some research on what had been built before just to get kind of an idea. We didn't wanted to make sure we weren't building into the same type of thing or, or you know, copying the same scale that someone else had done. Uh, so we did see this excellent example of the Tower of Baradur on the left uh, that it had been done at around a five foot scale. So we're like, okay, we, we want to make sure we're avoiding that. So we'll be using different pieces of different techniques and concepts throughout. Uh, and then there is another tower in Lord of the Rings that I'm, I'm spacing on the name, uh, which I feel terrible about, but uh, that had been done around the same scale that we were doing, that we were planning on doing ours at. Um, so some like we're making sure we're kind of keeping those in mind and, and making sure we were steering away from from similar things. Uh, so then we started into planning and prototyping. Um, we built a little like diagram out on all the different base plates that we wanted to do or build it on of like where each of the different uh, wall pieces would go and where each of the different towers that you see outside of the walls would go. Uh, and then in very small chunks, we started building what, what is the wall going to look like? How are we going to get the, the textures that we want on it? How are we going to get the shaping that we want on it? What are the pieces that we need to, to uh, procure to build out, you know, all of these different sections of the wall? Uh, so that was definitely the next part that we did. Uh -huh. Then we started prototyping, okay, what does it look like to do a landscape for this type of tower? We did a little research there uh, and started prototyping our own different ways that we would do it. Um, so we knew uh, part of the bar of is that it has like a rock face that goes up beside it uh, and it has a lava lake that goes through it. We're like, okay, how are we going to get the textures that are going to work in there? Uh, we ended up settling on these little fire pieces. When you kind of threw a whole bunch of them out, uh, you could get a really nice like lake that almost looked like it was moving. Uh, we talked about putting lights underneath that, which we ended up doing uh, for our most recent mock to get it like a little bit of a shine. Um, we were helped out a whole bunch there because at the Lego store, one of the pick a brick wall items at the back of the store was these, you know, these little pieces of fire. So we were able to get multiple cups of them that we could then use to, to kind of build out that, that river. And then we continued prototyping, started building more and more sections of the wall, started looking at how they were going to connect them, how we were going to make it so that they would be strong enough that they could uh, withstand um, transport also taking a look at how we were going to break it apart so that we could transport it again. Uh, that was really, really challenging with this project because you have this giant, you know, uh, half of a circle uh, of wall and you have to find places that you're going to be able to break it and have these giant tall walls still stand strong uh, despite being broken. So that was some good challenges there. Big growth opportunity on this one was looking at all of the details that we needed to put into the walls as they were going up the main spire. Uh, and then Adam had a fun challenge with the, the Technic side as well. Yeah. Cool. Oh. There's <laughs> buying lots of parts. Next thing was uh, yep, getting the supplies. Big, big lots giant of bags of, of just little one by two black bricks and two by two black bricks so that we could build things really, really strong. And then all of the details as well. 
And then we started taking all those little panels that you saw before and putting them into octagons uh, that would end up forming the, the basis of the, the spire. Well, that was kind of fun because again, it, it really pushed us creatively to take a lot of different detail pieces. Uh, I was very fond of just normal Lego bricks and building things out of that. This really pushed us into like, nope, you've got to expand the types of bricks you're using because it's so big that it's just going to be boring if you don't. Um, so that was a big challenge with this one. And here you can see kind of where we started getting to with the wall. Um, so you can see kind of that front entrance gate. You can see the little prototyping bits of wall. Now we've built them multiple times next to each other and started to build two or three walls behind it as well. So I was working on these outer walls and Adam started working on a technique piece that we'll get to see in a moment and then also the um, rock face behind. Uh, and so you can see we used a technique very similar to what's um, uh, what they used to do in, in Roman times of building kind of these, these archways behind uh, to really add structural stability to what was going to eventually end up holding uh, I think it was going to end up being three or four of those giant octagon spire pieces. So we knew it was going to have to be quite a bit of weight. Uh, yeah, three or four of those plus a mechanic piece at the top, um, plus a little, you know, more decorative pieces. So we knew we were going to have to build it really, really strong from the bottom. And then I was working on, come on, you can do it, on this eye that moved left to right and up and down. So it would look over the landscape. So that was my goal. So. Yeah, really, really nice technical challenge there getting, you know, two planes of, of motion in a very, very tiny space with as minimal weight as mm -hmm. possible because this was going to be up at nine feet tall. Mm -hmm. So very unfortunately, uh, we did end up losing that, that project as part of, we lost our house in a fire. Um, so unfortunately, we, you know, that's as far as we got on that project at that point in time. But as we've been rebuilding, we've been, you know, re regathering pieces to build it. And we are absolutely planning on, on redoing it in, in the next couple of years. So I'm looking forward to taking everything we learned from it the first time and, and carrying that forward. Yeah. Cool. So, so moving on from that, um, we, we started in 2020 working on, the club decided they were gonna do a collaborative jungle adventure. Uh, and so we started doing some concept research, took a look at other creations that people had done and said, oh, we really like the idea of, a, you, know, a, a, you know, a pirate's cove building by the river. And we really like all the detailed rock in, in these creations. And, why could we do? Um, so we had the idea of building a crazy jungle volcano with all sorts of cool stuff. Um, also, while we were doing research, we saw a lot of, you know, things that were representing uh, Mayan and Aztec cultures. Um, so we decided we could take some of those, you know, concepts and, and pull those in as well. Um, so that ended up being kind of what we focused on. And, and uh, we also had a lot of gray pieces. Uh, and so when we saw these images start to, to uh, show up, we're like, ah, we can use the great pieces. This is, this will be good. Uh, so we started yeah. planning. We, we took a little like Excel spreadsheet and the box, what were the boxes here? Were they eight studs by eight studs or no, something like that? The boxes there are base plates. The, oh, I meant the, the actual cells of the spreadsheet. No, the big boxes are base plates. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, they're eight, eight, eight by eight. Anyway, uh, so yeah, we, we laid out, we said, we're gonna have this big volcano in red here and then we'll have the Mayan Aztec ruins and a um, Pirate's Cove and a on a beach and um, yeah and yeah, a river. So yeah. Put in the river which is great because one of the big collaborative things that uh, hopefully many of you saw uh, in this year's MOA show was everyone or many folks built a river inside of a jungle uh, and so we, we created a standard for that and here's how they can all connect with one another here's how wide it should be uh, so that was that was cool. We got to collaborate, and it, you know the river went all the way through everyone's box. That really connected them. Here you can see us uh, as we were again, just like with the Tower of Baradur, doing some prototyping and planning. Uh, oftentimes, uh, so the 
picture on the right is actually the bottom of one of the rivers uh, where we were really trying to experiment with which colors looked best underneath uh, the blue tiles that we then put on top or the blue tiles that we put on top to give it kind of like a murky uh, uh, jungle river aspect to it. Uh, and then on the left, you can see uh, we built all the trunks of the trees. <laughs> we had to make sure we had enough trees because you never have enough trees. Uh, or you, we always need more than you think you do. So we put those down. We're trying to figure out, okay, how can we make it so you can see everything through the trees um, before building building out the the rest of like where the the building that was the Pirates Cove was going to sit. So here are some photos of the first half of the jungle that we uh, finished. We had that river and uh, part of the the mountain and the Aztec Temple and the Pirate's Cove. Um, we had some little jungle critters in here. There's a sloth hanging from a tree and there's a that Pokemon that I designed is hidden back here where my cursor's at. So back on our, our drawing that we did in the Google Sheet, we, this is about the, the right hand five by five uh, base weights. So we built those out first and then we continued on to the other the other half in time for the militia. Yeah. So hidden in here is a, a waterfall. I figured if we've got a giant mountain and a river, there's got to be a waterfall. So here's a prototype of just that. We had a, a motor turning a belt, which we were able to attach bricks to. So this was the skeleton. And then you can see it, you know, built up, built the rock around it to get that waterfall effect. And then let's see what else we had to do. I, I we had to do Indiana Jones getting chased by the boulder, so we had a prototype here of a, a you know a guy getting a chased around a circle with a boulder coming after him, and then gearing so that the boulder itself also spinned at a similar pace to the the guy, so it looked like the boulder was rolling after him or rolling before he. And then here's here's the same video after we built all the rock around it with that concept. So, and I had to add a jeep on the other side because that was fun too. So, and it was a good counterweight helps helped with yeah. the balance. Yeah. Uh, and then we had a volcano with lava, and so we built this um, this little set of piston pokers to poke um, lava, like a flexible lava uh, material that I'll show on the next slide. So here, so we built this lava river with flexible lava. And I, we had a, you know, these piston pokers underneath to poke it to make the bubbling effect. So that was another new moving idea that worked out pretty well. So, yeah. So, let's see. Yeah. Other things that we built in was a fun little rock arc, arc tray that we knew we'd put next to the water. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's where Adam put way too many crabs down on the, at the water's edge. We had a lot of fun with that. Yeah. So that was the second half. Um, Look, we're already building towards next year's show, uh, which is going to be Dia de los Muertos. Um, do you mind going to the next slide? Awesome. Yeah. Or one more, too. Yeah. Um, Dia de los Muertos is going to be another collaborative build. So lots of folks are building. Uh, we are using the, the movie Coco as kind of a, a sub theme to it. Um, so we're going to have both a, a city of the living and a city of the dead. And we've you know, put together standards just like we saw earlier for what should the roads look like, what should the buildings be like side, size wise, how are they going to interact with each other so that when you've got, you know, 40 people bringing their, their mocks up, created, uh, you know, everything's going to fit together and you don't have to do as much planning before the show. Uh, the big thing that, that we immediately were drawn to in the movie Coco was there's this giant tower uh, and up at the top uh, that they do a, a um, they like do a, a oh goodness like a celebrating uh, celebratory party at 
So there's this giant mansion that you see on the left hand side up at the very top of the tower. So that felt like a really nice technical challenge. Uh, Adam's already dreading it because my, my hope is that he can figure out how to uh, mechanize the top of the tower so it rotates. Um, but we'll, we'll see, that's, that sounds quite difficult. Um, so this is what we're looking at building. Uh, so fun challenge at the very beginning was how do you get Lego to look pretty round to get that, that structure. Um, so first thing we did was take a look at how can we get that, that top um, structure that's going to stick out and how can we make that really, really strong because it has to be able to support all of the weight of the mansion. And then we started building into what should this mansion look like and oh goodness, does it fit within the circle and it just barely did, thank goodness. Uh, so we've been building that out. Uh, and so after that, we are like, all right, let's build the tower. So using one of our favorite techniques, which was, uh, you know, using those one by one round pieces in between bricks, uh, we started building up the tower. We did it in multiple uh, kind of U-shaped uh, sections that then we could layer in with an inner structure that kind of holds them all tight to get that look of the original tower. So Adam's holding up the, the two pieces. It's not strong enough yet to hold it all by itself, um, but that's that's my next uh, challenge is to build up that center structure even more through that top design part so that we can hold up that the mansion at the top. Yeah. So that pretty much concludes the things that we've been working on. Um, so yeah, to, you know, just to clarify, we're part of the Bay Area's Lego users group. We're a club of, you know, a couple hundred Lego enthusiasts across the Bay of all ages. We meet about once a month, half the time it's via Zoom, and then a quarter of the time it's at, at MOA, and then a quarter of the time it's at an East Bay location in San Leandro. Um, we talk about creations we're doing and upcoming events and we have little mini build competitions and games and things. And it's a great opportunity to talk to other Lego builders like us and other, other members of the community about what they're interested in building. And um, it inspires us to build more crazy things. So yeah, if you're interested in the club, uh, we have a website, baylug.org, um, or you can ask, you know, email me if you have any questions about the club. Uh, anyone can join. Um, and if you join, you can show off all your creations that are at our events. So, yeah. Members range in age from, you know, young three, four, five age builders uh, up until, you know, 80s, 90s. People come of all, all ages. Yeah. Great. Well, um, thank you, Adam and Simone. I really appreciate the time you took. Uh, it was an interesting and fun uh, lecture. Um, we want to open um, it up with um, any uh, questions. And I've already got a question from Mark. Um, and uh, I think it has to do with the um, volcano. He said, how did you make the lava net? The lava net. So let me go back to that. We have uh, the, the black net pieces are here and they're an actual part. And then we have the little transparent red pieces. So what we what we did is we had a one by two plate and then we put the net on top of that. And then we took the transparent red plates and put them in between the grids on the net because the, the dimension of the net is the size of a one Lego piece. So you can put the little round plates in between there and then stick a plate on top. And that kind of sandwiches the net in between the plates in a way that makes it kind of flexible. Yeah. All right. Um, did we have any um, more questions for um, Adam or Simone? Um, you can um, type it in the question and answer, or you could type it in the chat, or you can um, click the raise your hand and I can just call on you to ask your question. Well, um, I don't think- um, uh, I have, have to see. 
Oh, I have a question actually. Michelle <laughs> raised her hand. Um, yes, I did. Um, what is the best way to keep all your pieces organized? I think I saw it in the background of one of the slides, but okay. what's the best way um, to keep all the pieces together? It's something that's definitely evolved over time. Uh, a couple of our favorite bins uh, most come from Michael's just because that's that's where I ended up going a lot, but uh, they sell this uh, like photo box uh, that's like a, a plastic bin that has uh, 16 little bins inside of it. That was really good for like detailed pieces because you could keep them separate but organized by category all in one box. Um, we've, yeah, yep, exactly those. Um, we've done what we call graduating pieces up to larger bins quite a bit. Uh, and so we've, we've kind of changed uh, our bin sizes, but we, we do typically keep them in um, mostly plastic bins and then just increasing sizes. And then we put them on shelves and we've got little labels that we put on them uh, and then keep that in a, a Google sheet so we know where things are. Mm -hmm. And we sort kind of by shape and kind of by color. So we kind of do both. Like we'll do maybe like the light gray and the dark gray triangle pieces mm -hmm. all as one, you know, in one kind of bin. So it's kind of by shape and kind of by color in a way that kind of makes sense. Different, different Lego folks store different ways. And it really kind of depends. It's all kind of a balance between how much time do you want to spend sorting and how much time do you want to spend digging for pieces? Mm -hmm. And if you're building like small stuff, like if I'm building little, little like random little details and things, digging for parts might not be bad. If I only need to find like one of a piece might be not that, that bad to dig for it. But if you're going to build, you know, a giant castle with where you need a thousand pieces of this particular type the and having type. them sorted is a necessity. You can't dig through unsorted brick for all of that. So it just kind of depends on what you're building. So different members sort differently, I would say. And to be honest, Adam and I sort differently as well. You yeah. can definitely tell <laughs> we've got big bins of just bulk bricks all together on his side of the garage. <laughs> and you've got more of the bins of, of lots of the same pieces on my side. All right. Well, I don't think uh, we have any more um, questions here. Uh, I don't see any more. Um, I want to um, thank um, Adam and Simone. Uh, appreciate the time um, that you took to uh, put this um, fun lecture together and to share um, the hobby, your hobby, um, with us and Moa. We really appreciate it. And uh, we are um, already looking forward um, to the next uh, Baylug show um, at MOA. So everybody, thank you so much um, for joining us. And um, yes, if you've seen this, we are recording um, the lecture. So if there's anything um, that you missed um, or want to replay, uh, it will be available at MOA at www.moah.org. All right. Well, um, everybody have a good night and thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh.